student at MIT just finishing up working with Eric Demain in Computer Index. Um, he has a wide variety of interests ranging from learning to computer randomness to streaming algorithms and today he's going to talk about something completely different um, from all of that, I think. Oh, well, there's some, okay, there's some, some uh, overlap. yeah, <laughs> there's some overlap. Okay, thanks. Okay, and uh, what I'm going to talk about today is based on a couple of joint works with Daniel Kane. And um, so first, let me tell you what the Johnson and Stress Lemma is. Uh, so it says that every point in n-dimensional Euclidean space can be embedded into um, some dimensionality that only depends on log n and poly 1 over epsilon, uh, such that the pairwise distances between all points are preserved up to a multiplicative 1 plus minus epsilon factor. Okay. And it has uh, a few applications. So, I mean, one natural application is if you have some algorithm that's uh, some working with really high dimensional vectors, it probably is slower as a function of the dimensionality. And in fact, there are algorithms like nearest neighbor search where it's exponentially slower. Um, so first what you do is you take your vectors, you project them down to smaller dimension, and then you run your algorithm on these smaller dimensional vectors. Okay. <clears throat> um, also, there's some work by Sarlosh as well as uh, Clarkson and Woodruff showing that if you have uh, the Johnson-Lennon-Strauss uh, Johnson -Strauss transform, then uh, you can plug them into linear algebra algorithms like low rank approximation and linear regression and uh, get faster algorithms. Basically, you can shrink the matrices, then run algorithms on these shrunk matrices. Okay? Um, also, there was some work. Uh, showing equivalence between uh, Johnson and Strauss, like so, this you know can be embedded. These are going to turn out to be linear embeddings, right? So we're going to come up with distributions over matrices such that a random matrix works with uh, high probability. And uh, there's a connection between such distributions over matrices and uh, so-called restricted isometry property matrices and compressed sensing. So one direction turns out to be pretty obvious, which is that if you have a, a, a distribution for Johnson Linden Strauss that, that satisfies the JL lemma, then a random such matrix satisfies RIP. Uh, I won't talk really what RIP is, but there was some recent, uh, I don't know, a paper I really like by Kramer and Ward showing that the opposite is true. If you have any fixed RIP matrix and you multiply it by some random sign matrix, uh, that will give you a JL distribution. Okay. And it's also used in some uh, manifold learning applications, which uh, uh, I need to learn more about to myself. So, okay. Oh, by the way, uh, this talk is designed in such a way that uh, my goal is to turn you into jail experts by the end of the talk. So, you know, you can interrupt me all you know as frequently as you want. So, it's, uh, <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Okay. So, how do you prove the JL lemma? There's this probabilistic sublemma which says that if you give me epsilon and delta, some fractions, then there is a distribution mapping into this target dimension so that any vector of unit norm has its L2 norm preserved with probability 1 minus delta. Okay? And then you, know, you can prove the JL lemma using this probabilistic sublemma by setting delta to be 1 over n squared and then union bounding over all the pairwise difference vectors. Okay. <coughs> And in terms of the JL lemma, uh, it's known that the target dimension in the JL lemma is nearly tight. That's a theorem of alone. Uh, up, it's tight up to this log 1 or epsilon factor. Uh, but actually, this dimension for this probabilistic sublemma is, uh, is exactly tight. And that's, a theorem, that's due to JRM and Woodruff. Okay? So if you want, potentially, if this were the right answer, or if something less than 1 epsilon squared log n were the right answer, you would have to prove it in a different way than than using the sublemma and then union bounding. So the tightness is for linear embeddings or for R just any distribution? Um, so I know for this, oh, this, this is for arbitrary embedding. This one, uh, I'm not 100% sure. I know, I, I know a proof which is only for linear embeddings, but I don't know if, I don't know if their proof is only for linear embeddings. I, I don't think so. Uh, I think their proof, well, I know their proof goes through communication complexity where people have different vectors. I, I doubt that it 
has any dependency on linearity, but uh, I'm not, I don't want to assert that without uh, knowing for sure. OK, so here's the plan. First, I'm going to show you how to prove the J. So I'm only going to talk about the, this probabilistic sublemma. I'm going to prove it for you. Um, modulo a lemma, which I'm not going to prove. But that lemma is going to, that lemma is going to you know, play a role in other parts of the talk, too. Uh, and then I'm going to show you a pretty decent derandomization, uh, but it's not optimal, uh, unfortunately. And then I'm going to show you how you can come up with a distribution over sparse matrices um, satisfying the JL lemma. Okay. And uh, of course, if you have a sparse matrix, you can multiply by it more quickly. So that's the advantage there. And I'm actually going to spend uh, quite a few slides discussing open problems, because there, there are a number of them, actually. OK. So first, let's do the J, uh, proof, let me prove the JL probabilistic sublemma. lemma. OK. So what do the older proofs do? So the original proof, what it did was it said, um, take your vector, randomly rotate it, and project it onto the first k coordinates. Okay. Then there were proofs, uh, in, first in Degmatwani, then Dasgupta Gupta. They said, take your matrix and make each entry uh, standard normal. Okay. And then divide your whole matrix by some scaling factor. Uh, Akhlyupta showed that you don't, you, know, you don't need Gaussians. You can get away with Bernoullis. And in fact, he came up with a construction where only a third of the matrix is non-zero. So it, it was sparser than, than the previous constructions, but by a constant factor. Okay? <coughs> and this work was the same construction as this, but it showed that you only need bound independent entries. And I guess this is the more general in the class. Uh, so sub-Gaussian tails, I just mean that it decays at least as quickly as a Gaussian does. So what I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you a proof of this, uh, this version, modulo some lemma, which I'm just going to invoke. Uh, and it's only going to need bound independence. OK. Questions about anything? No. OK, and to prove it, I'm going to use this, t this moment bound. OK? <coughs> um, it just says that if you have some matrix T, and you have a vector sigma where, each, where its entries are uh, independent coming from some uh, sub-Gaussian tail distribution, okay? then you have this bound on the high order moments. OK. And of course, uh, uh, question? Just run through what everything needs? Yeah, OK. So um, Good. So the trace of t happens to be the expectation of sigma transpose t sigma, right? Because uh, the the cross terms. So what is you know this is this is a sum over i j t i j sigma i sigma j, and whenever you have the whenever you have the off diagonal term sigma i sigma j, the expectation is zero because these have mean zero, and then whenever you have the diagonal terms, so those are the t i i sigma i squareds, the expectation of sigma i squared is one, because it has variance one. So the expectation of this is the trace of t. So this is a central moment bound, which you can also view as being a concentration about the mean. Okay. So, <clears throat> oh right, the next slide. Yeah. Okay. Is that <laughs> okay. Good. So, uh, this is the Frobenius norm, which is like looking at like sort of like the L2 norm if you look at the matrix as a vector, and uh, the operator norm is the largest, largest eigenvalue. Okay. So. Um, Wow, yeah, I don't know what I was, I, there's supposed to be a max here. There's a max here, yeah. Any questions? No. So, so, yeah, so just, so, so C is an absolute constant? Yeah, C is a constant, an absolute constant. Okay. So nothing it, depends on N. Nothing depends on N, that's correct. Um, well, the Frobenius norm is presumably going to grow somehow. I, it I guess, yeah. It depends on what you're applying it to. Um, right. Yeah. Good. Is there something you want to say? Yeah. And uh, I, I guess I won't show you how to prove it, at least in this full generality. But one thing I'll say is um, 
Of course, if you have, imagine that sigma, the sigma i's were actually Gaussian, independent Gaussians, OK? And then you have this matrix T. Then you know that there's this, uh, you know, the theorem that uh, if you apply um, any orthogonal transformation to a vector of Gaussians, you get back a vector of independent Gaussians, OK? So the way that you would prove this for, say, Gaussian entries in the sigma is you would diagonalize T with some uh, orthogonal matrix, which you can do because it's uh, symmetric. And then um, you can treat that uh, orthogonal matrix times sigma as being another vector of independent Gaussians. And then what this becomes really is just a sum of uh, squared Gaussians with coefficients. And then you just do some computation. So that's how you, so this is fairly easy to prove when the sigma i's are Gaussian, but you can prove it for any for any uh, distribution that has sub-Gaussian tails. Okay. okay, so now that we have this, uh, this theorem by Hansen and Wright, how do we use it to prove uh, the johnson linden strauss lemma? Okay, so, <coughs> okay, so I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take this matrix, uh, my embedding matrix S uh, to just have independent entries uh, from some, from some uh, distribution that looks like this. That means zero variance one sub Gaussian tails. Okay? And I'm going to divide the whole matrix by root k. But is, you know, k is the dimension you're mapping to? I'm, embed yeah, I'm, embed I'm mapping from d dimensions to k. Okay? And now let's look at the L2 norm squared of the embedded vector. Okay? I mean, um, it just happens to be this if you write it out. Okay? And now, so this is great. This is the error term. And I want to show that the error term is small uh, with high probability. OK, and of course, this is a quadratic form in the sigmas, right, where my matrix depends on x. So this error, t this error term is sigma transpose t sigma. And t happens to be a block diagonal matrix that looks like this. OK? Each block is xx transpose. And now it's pretty easy to compute the Frobenius and operator norms of this matrix, right? So uh, xx transpose has a, a Frobenius norm squared that looks like this, right? Uh, maybe I'll just write it down. Is this, is this clear? Or, uh, right? X, what is xx transpose? It's just this thing. There are the squares on the diagonal and then the cross terms over here. And then you sum the squares of this thing, and you get, uh, you get that. And uh, of course, this is a rank 1 matrix. And the only, the only eigenvector it has with non-zero eigenvalue is x. And x has eigenvalue L2 norm squared of x. But I divide by k, because I have k on the outside. Okay? And that's, uh, that's it, really. Now you just apply the theorem. Okay. So that's the pr proof of the JL lemma. Any questions? Uh, here, some someone saying something. Again, could you just like read us through it to say what the conclusion was? Oh, good. Okay, so <clears throat> um, <coughs> the conclusion is okay. So what is S? I'm saying, I'm just saying S is. Uh, can, can you see the Swasta, Can you see like the board here? Yeah. Okay. So I'm just saying, if you pick S to be this matrix, you know, sigma one one, sigma one d, sigma k one, sigma k d, all over root k, then, you know, you can write the L two norm squared of S x like this. And notice your error term is really just a quadratic form in sigma. So, so the sigmas are uh, assumed to be the sub-Gaussian? Me, yeah, mean, so for example, yeah, mean zero variance one sub-Gaussian tail. So you can pick Gaussians, you can pick Bernoullis, or you can pick basically any distribution that has finite support uh, as long as you make them have mean zero variance uh, one. So any such distribution would work. OK? And uh, yeah, so. Once you notice that the error is this, is this quadratic form, you just apply Hansen right on a high moment. So now I'm just applying Markov to the elf moment. 
Okay. And uh, you're done, basically. Okay, well, epsilon is a big number. Is not... you, epsilon, uh, epsilon is a small number. Oh. One over epsilon is potentially big. Oh, but then the right hand side is not so big. Oh, okay, good. So, yeah, so now let me, why are you done? So, I want this whole thing to be less than delta, right? So, I'm going to set L to be log 1 over delta. And then I want the things on the inside to be less than a half. So, that, so here, k needs to be at least L over epsilon times a constant. So that's log 1 over delta over epsilon. Here, k needs to be at least L. And then square root of k has to kill this epsilon. So you need k to be 1 over epsilon squared times L. So that's the target dimension we wanted, was 1 over epsilon squared times log 1 over delta. Yeah? And uh, I'm using only the log 1 over delta at the moment which only requires 2 times log 1 over delta y's independence, right? Because I have a, a degree 2 polynomial. Um, so that's it. OK. Any questions about the proof? OK. So now I'm going to talk to you about uh, de-randomizing JL. And I'm going to actually, so this thing is going to be also equally simple to prove. Uh, so first, let me talk about a little history of derandomizing JL. Um, OK, so there were some works before on, remember, there, the J, there's the JL lemma and then the JL probabilistic sublemma. I've been talking about them differently. So the JL lemma itself, if I give you all the endpoints up front and I say, find me a good embedding, then there is an algorithm. There are, there are works uh, which are not oblivious to the points. They look at them and they come up with an embedding. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, Alon, Matis, and Segedi, um, they didn't really talk about it as being a JL embedding, but it, it is. Uh, they come up with a distribution with this seed length and this target dimension. Okay? And in fact, you can get, uh, you, due to these works, you can get the same exact uh, results where, actually, where you have the additional property that each column only has one non-zero entry. So you get a very sparse matrix from these. OK. So, but the way you'd want is something like log 1 over delta rather than over delta for the AMS. AMS? Oh, actually, so this seed length is great. Log, log d plus log 1 over delta is good. But the target dimension, so. I mean, that would be a polynomial number of uh, mappings. Because in the JL lemma, I set delta to be 1 over n squared. So this would be like log d plus log n seed length. But n squared dimension. Right. Oh, 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 yeah. The dimension is the bad thing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's what. Dimension is that thing. Um, good. So Karnan, Rabani, Spielka, um, the result is similar to the AMS result in that uh, you again have this poly 1 over epsilon, poly 1 over delta dependence on the dimension. Uh, but where they gain is on the dependence. So Basically, there are a near linear number of mappings if delta is not too small. Okay, so that's the seed length that they get. If you're applying it to the JL lemma, yes. But there, there, yeah, there are applications where you don't care about the JL lemma; you only care about the sublemma. And then delta can be a constant. So, for example, in the applications to numerical linear algebra, uh, delta is so let's say your matrices that you're working with are like uh, s by t, then you're going to make delta be exponentially small in s or something, or in t. So it uh, depends on how rectangular your matrices are. If your matrices are really uh, not square-like, then exponentially small in the small dimension of the matrix is not so bad. Is that a question? No. OK. OK, good. And I just showed you a proof. So this is the proof I just showed you needing only log 1 over delta y's independence is not the same as their proof. But uh, they also showed that um, you, know, you can get away with this seed length just by using log 1 over delta y's independence. Okay. And what I'm going to show you is um, uh, how to get the optimal target dimension with smaller seed length. And there was a similar bound obtained by Mecca. It was only slightly worse in that 
some of these log 1 over delta terms have like log d over delta in them. But um, it doesn't really matter so much for the JL lemma. That only really matters for the probabilistic sublemma. Okay. Um, okay, so let me just uh, run through this bound to digest it a little bit. Um, so if epsilon is a constant, then this is like log d plus log 1 over delta log log 1 over delta, which is, which is good except for this uh, log log 1 over delta term. Okay. Epsilon is the distortion? Uh, epsilon is the distortion. 1 plus epsilon distortion. Yeah. Is 1 over epsilon squared times log 1 over delta. Yeah. That's the k the, that I'm embedding into. OK? And really, so I'm going to go on to the next, you know, the answer is like uh, almost here. Notice that, oh, uh, yeah? So what was the optimization for you there? Oh, uh, yeah, so there's, there's a lower bound of, uh, OK, so suppose that my JL family, my JL distribution works like this. I have some set of matrices, and I pick one from that set at random. OK, then there are lower bounds on how big that set needs to be. And the lower bound you would get uh, on the seed length from that is like, uh, I think, log 1 over delta plus log uh, d over k. So as long as k is not very close to d, that amounts to a log d over delta lower bound. Well, I mean, it depends on it depends on what epsilon and delta are, right? Like, if k is very, very close to d, then yeah. I mean, uh, as long as you're embedding significantly, as long as you're reducing the the dimension significantly, then it's log d over delta. So ideally, the epsilon, the log one over epsilon should not be multiplied but added, but like, usually epsilon is big enough that you don't care. Um, yeah. Uh, this if this were added, that would be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, the target dimension is provably optimal. So I'm embedding, oh, oh, oh. I'm embedding into dimension 1 over epsilon squared times log 1 over delta. And that provably is the optimal target dimension. Yeah. Uh, what happens if you uh, have a set of, set of matrices and you pick the best one and then lower one for epsilon? You have a set of matrices and you pick the, yeah, that's, that's still the lower bound. Oh, wait, you said you pick random and you pick random. Oh, oh, oh. Wait, so, okay, say it again, what you just said. That if you, oh, like how many do you need? Then uh, that is the lower bound without the log one over delta. Yeah. Okay. And really, the idea to get this uh, de-randomized variant is 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 right here. So the idea is just. Um, if you, use, if you use log 1 over delta y's independence right away, uh, then that, that forced you to set k to be something, right? Um, OK, so this is, this is, what, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to just gradually reduce the dimension. So I have some, uh, so this is the idea. I'm going to gradually reduce the, the dimension. And remember that this was the, this was the uh, tail inequality that I had before, right? So. <coughs> If I set k to be something really, really large, then I don't need L to be uh, that large anymore, right? So first, I'm going to embed into some dimension which is exponentially bigger. But then that allows me to set L equal to, right? And pairwise independence over this uh, matrix only is going to cost me log d random bits. And then I'm going to gradually embed from this dimension lower and lower. So I'm going to go from delta to root delta to fourth root of delta, et cetera. OK. And uh, the calculations just work out that uh, at each step, the amount of uh, the, the seed length that you need basically becomes a geometric series. And you get, you get what I said before. OK. So I don't know. Uh, it's nothing too fancy.
Sure. Very sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, I guess. So I should I should I should state maybe up front that so in part of this talk you know uh, there are some I, I only want to tell you for some things how it works and then uh, you know if you really want to know the calculations uh, they're not interesting is uh, I promise you <laughs> uh, <laughs> so but this one I could probably understand given a few minutes so that's true <laughs> that's true so let me have a few minutes or uh, okay if you want them <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, so the amount of, <coughs> OK, good. OK, so uh, so good. So at level j, l ends up being about 2 to the j. Okay. Yeah. Um, right, so the prob so there, there are going to be something like log log one over delta levels of this. Right. So um, your error probability at the end will be like delta times log log one over delta. Okay. But if you just run through the calculations with a, with a slightly smaller delta prime, that doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, I so I realize there's a temptation to want to do the calculations now, but I promise you, there's more interesting stuff. Uh, that I, uh, <laughs> that I, but I think we should get through everything. Oh, OK, fine. Okay, well, <laughs> okay. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, so just, so you're. Right, so OK, so first, embedding into this dimension, right? So this term ends up always being not the dominant term. OK, so, <clears throat> so k is 1 over epsilon squared over delta. Uh, the epsilon squared gets square rooted and cancel this thing. Yeah. and and now you have a root delta, okay, to the L, and you really want that to be delta, so you'd set L to be two, right. okay. So that's that. <coughs> and then uh, you want to embed into, so we're gradually reducing the dimension. Next, you're going to embed into uh, uh, one over epsilon squared over root delta, okay. And now the thing is, <coughs> the thing is. Before, what, if you were using L-wise independence, your seed length was L times log D, right? Yeah. Or in fact, uh, it's really log DK because your, your matrix is K by D. But K is less than D anyway, right. so it's log D. OK, so I, I didn't want a big L to multiply log D. But now my dimension is 1 over epsilon squared delta. Right. So that's really where this. That's really where this construction is saving, is that um, basically the big L's, you know, as, as so th gradually this thing is going to be like 1 over 2 to the j times log 1 over delta, right? As I go from, uh, as, I, as I gradually reduce the dimension. Right. So I can afford to make L bigger and bigger. So you make L roughly 2 to the j. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. So that's that's really all there is going on. Yeah. So, so now, so that well, it gives you, you know, by making all of these seed lengths equal, you're getting, you know, that's what gives you the extra log log factor. Yes. In fact, uh, so I said that it's a geometric series. That actually doesn't even matter because in the end, I'm going to union bound and argue that all these levels worked. So I couldn't use this. I can use the same seed across all levels. But actually, the last level is the one that is the dominant level in terms of seed length. So that causes this seed length already. So where does the log log? So at the end, I get to some dimension. Let's say 1 over epsilon squared log cubed 1 over delta. And then I need a final embedding to get me down to the optimal dimension. And that, that final embedding is already costing me everything. I see. Yeah. previous part is you know a suboptimal dimension but with optimal seed length. So um, you can like have epsilon squared log cubed one over delta rather than uh, 
Right. Wait, so that... No, even, even the previous part is suboptimal uh, seed length. Because, so this, is, this 2 to the j is killing this 2 to the j. And I get log 1 over delta. But that happens log log 1 over delta times. Because that's the number of levels in my gradual stuff. Oh, I can use the seed. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, okay. Yeah, good point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so right. So, yeah, you can also view it as optimal seed length for constant epsilon. Right. Except for the last step. Right. That's true. That is true. All right, good point. Yeah. Oh. Yes, you do need to set epsilon to be a little bit smaller, too. Uh, yeah, good point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the final distribution is you have a pairwise independent matrix and then a polarized independent matrix, but that's why you multiply them out and yep. that has the yeah. property. Yep. But they're smaller and smaller dimensions, basically. They're yeah. yeah, they're not all the same dimensionality, yeah. Okay. So. Anything else uh, people want to ask about this thing? OK. So the next thing that I want to talk to you about is sparsifying the Johnson-Lewis stress lemma. OK, so. Uh, maybe just one question about the, this one. So uh, uh, yeah. is pairwise independent uh, the best thing uh, to use here? I mean, maybe it could use something that generates a logic deep polynomial. Or, you know. um, I don't know. I mean. Uh, I want to preserve high moments. Can I preserve these kinds of things with uh, those other constructions? I mean, I mean, using the fact that it's closed poly polynomial, it should be L, right? I'm using, uh, yes. Fools are exactly. So you mean like using almost KYs independence or something? Yeah, yeah. 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 but not at some point. The yeah, I don't. that the coefficients of these polynomials are large. Mm -hmm. I see. So I'm not sure it would save you anything. OK. So sparsifying jail. So the proofs that I've been showing you, like uh, every entry of the matrix is independent, sub-Gaussian tails. These are all dense constructions, OK? so. How can we come up with a distribution where a significant fraction of the matrix is, is zero? Okay. <clears throat> so the first uh, construction that gave a somewhat sparse GL was by Ocleoptis. So he gave a Bernoulli construction. Uh, each entry is independent Bernoulli uh, divided by some scale factor. And then you go through the matrix and you set each uh, entry to be zero at, you know, with some probability, with probability two thirds. Okay. Okay. Uh, how about sparser constructions? So I'm always going to refer to the sparsity as S, which is the number of non-zero entries per column of the embedding matrix. OK? So th the first thing to get some kind of improvement for the sparsity bound was by Dasgupta, Kumar, and Sarlos. And they remember that k is like 1 over epsilon squared times log 1 over delta, right? Uh, and they get that only 1 over epsilon things are non-zero per column, although uh, the dependence on delta is larger. So this is, only, this is only sparse when epsilon is very small compared to log 1 over delta. OK. And then uh, Daniel, Kane, and I gave uh, another analysis of exactly the same construction uh, based on just, you know, so I showed you this uh, hansen right inequality. So we looked at their matrix and we showed, and it's a random matrix, but we showed that it's Frobenius and operator norms with small with high probability. Okay? And doing that, we, we managed to get a bound like this. And uh, there was a follow-up work giving an even tighter analysis, getting rid of some of these log 1 over epsilon and log log 1 over delta factors. Okay, but what I'm going to show you today is actually, uh, so all of these were analyzing the same construction that was in this work. Okay? And what I want to show you today is that actually there's a different construction which is even sparser. Um, so you can, get, you can get a sparsity parameter, which is something like this, okay? which, is, which is always better than k. So column sparsity s meaning? 
if I draw my if I draw my matrix yeah, yeah. and look at any column, yeah. only s non-zero entries yeah, per column. Number, s is the number of non-zeros per column. So Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. Each. Oh, with a certain value of k. E yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, an order of epsilon fraction of the matrix. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Uh, and again, this construction is only going to need to use some log whenever delta y is independent stuff. So. OK. Uh, so I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you, uh, let's see, what do I want to show you? Good. OK. I'm going to show you a warm-up construction, and then I'm going to show you the actual construction which achieves this. And the warm-up construction, the warm-up construction is actually going to achieve. Uh, S being O of let's say uh, one over epsilon times the square root of log one over epsilon delta log one over delta. So it's, it's almost going to be the right thing, except when epsilon is really small. It could be off by this root log one over epsilon factor. And then uh, I'm going to show you how you can just tweak the construction a little bit and get, the op get what I promised you. Unfortunately, when you tweak it a little bit, the same analysis uh, is not quite the right one anymore. But in this simpler version, the analysis ends up being quite short. OK. And <clears throat> okay, so I have some words here, but I, I'm going to follow up these words with a pretty picture. Um, okay, good. So it's going to be based on codes, and uh, basically, what I'm going to do here's my matrix which is mapping d dimensions down to k dimensions. I'm going to look at any column of this matrix. Okay. And I'm going to break it up into chunks. And there are going to be s chunks. Okay. Each chunk is of size k over s. So let's look at this chunk. OK? And there's going to be uh, only one non zero entry per chunk. Let's say this one. And everything else is zero in that chunk. And this is going to have a random sign. And I'm going to divide this whole matrix by root s. That's the whole construction. OK? And now the question is. How do I decide which thing is non-zero? And I'm going to decide which thing is non-zero using an error correcting code. OK? okay so, could you say that again? So there's s chunks. Yeah, so, this may, so I'm looking at, let's say, this, this is the ith column. Yeah. Maybe I'll draw this matrix a little bigger so you can see better. S chunks. And if I look at any given chunk, let's say the orth chunk, this is chunk R, chunk the number R, then it has it has k over s entries in that chunk, right? And one of these entries is going to be non-zero. I haven't told you yet which entry. And all the other entries will be 0 in that chunk. And the entry that's non-zero is going to have a random sign. And then I'm going to divide this whole matrix by root s. So that's, that's the construction. Okay. 
and I'm gonna I'm gonna tell the way that I'm going to. Um, so I can write down for you, for let's say this is the ith. This is the ith uh, column of my matrix, right? So my ith column is going to have some. Uh, let me let me write down which index. This is a number between one and k over s, okay? Which index is going to be non-zero? In the first chunk, it's some index t1. In the second chunk, it's some index t2. And I write down this thing. And the property that I want is that. If I look at C1 up to CD, those are my D columns, and write them this way, this should be a good code. OK? So that's the, whole, that's the construction. So code meaning like just difference? Uh, like yeah, the Hamming distance between each pair of things should be uh, large. Uh, actually, I want a really good code. So this code is of an, over an alphabet of size. Um, Q, Q being k over s, yeah. and I want the relative distance to be almost perfect, 1 minus O of 1 over Q. That's the kind of code that I want. 1 over Q. Well, like, yeah, O of 1 over Q. So kind of like uh, read problems. Or uh, like Hadamard codes? Yeah, uh, yeah. But O of 1 over Q. One, I, don't, I don't care to get precisely 1 over Q. Yeah, but uh, that's the, yeah. So this, right, so the length of the code word is s. So if you pull out an s from these, then it's the relative distance is 1 minus o of s over k, which is like 1 minus o of 1 over q. Yeah. OK? So um, I have until what, 12.15? Is that right? We're not that strict. How, how strict are you? Oh, OK. <laughs> OK. OK, so uh, I have a pretty picture, but I guess I, I feel like the board, uh, can you really see from there? That's crazy. I didn't, oh, yeah, you can. It's, I didn't expect that. OK. Um, OK, good. So everyone clear on what the construction is, at least? OK, good. So now I'll show you why this construction works. And uh, then I'll show you how to fix the construction to not lose this factor. And in fact, uh, fixing the construction, I'll tell you right now, Basically, rather than, uh, rather than using it with an arbitrary code, I'm going to pick the code at random. And I'm going to use more than the fact that it's just a code. OK. So uh, again, I can write down my embedded vector, y equals sx. And I can write down what the L2 norm squared of y is. And again, I get the L2 norm squared of x plus an error term. Okay, um, and I'm I'm writing this uh, this eta i j r as being. Uh, I mean, it's not a random variable because c can be c doesn't necessarily have to be random, but it, it's an indicator for uh, code code word i and code word j agreeing on the rth symbol. And. Uh, I'm going to basically prove it the same way that I proved the other JL, which is using Han the Hansen right inequality on a high order moment. And all I need to do now is bound the operator and Frobenius norms of the matrix. And in fact, um, that, so that's really how we came up with this thing in the first place was what well, we said, let's just, you know, we should design a matrix that gives us low Frobenius and operator norms. So it's sort of a reverse engineered uh, construction. <coughs> okay. so. Mm. This thing is my error term. And again, it's a quadratic form in sigma. So I can write down what the matrix corresponding to that quadratic form is. Okay, So it's a block diagonal matrix. There's one block for, for every uh, chunk. Okay, And what, is, what does the rth chunk look like? Well, trij is this thing. Xixj appears only if ij collide. If i and j don't collide, it's 0. So now I just need to bound the Frobenius and operator norms of this thing. OK. So let's compute the Frobenius norm squared of this matrix. OK. So um, maybe so that people don't forget, 
I'll write down the matrix on the board. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> so the Frobenius norm squared, that's the sum of the squares of all entries in the matrix. Okay, so let's look at in any given chunk in any given chunk I have my I'll have my xi xj term there only if i and j collide in that chunk. Right? So I ha I add in my xi squared xj squared for every single chunk where they collide, okay, and then I divide by s squared because my matrix has a 1 over s outside of it. And now I just use the fact that it's a good code. So uh, what is this? This is exactly the Hamming distance, or this is exactly uh, kind of s minus the Hamming distance, right? This is where do those code words collide? Where do they agree? Well, it's a code. They don't agree in that many places. They only agree in s squared over k places. So that's my squared Frobenius norm. Okay. And then let's bound the operator norm. So uh, whenever you have a block diagonal matrix, the eigenvalues are just the eigenvalues of each block. So let's just look at one particular block, T sub r. And, <coughs> and um, so. Okay, so T sub r, what does it look like? It has zeros on the diagonal. And then it'll have, uh, you know, it'll have each diagonal term only if they collide. Okay. Um, and, <coughs> good. So, I claim that I can write T sub r as the difference of two matrices, each of which will be easy to bound the operator norm of. Okay? So the first matrix is the matrix where I fill in the, the diagonals with the xi squareds. Okay? And that's, that's capital D. Okay? The other matrix is, well, there are these k over s different locations inside that chunk, okay? And let's look at everybody who maps into the first location, okay? That's u1. So that's this u1. I'm going to put them all in a vector and zero out everyone else, yeah? Let's look at everybody who maps to the second location. I'm going to put them in u2. Okay, and I claim that T, T sub r is just this. So do people want me to, to write this? I can write this on the board and make it, you know, if it's not clear yet why this is true. Should I write on the board? Sure. No. Okay. Can people see this board? Can you see that board? Okay, um, so the point is, I have these k over s chunks. I mean, s chunks, each one is of size k over s. There are k over s locations. And let's say I have my, let's say I have my, you know, five-dimensional vector where one and four happen to map to the first location, you know, two and three map to the fourth location, and five is by itself in this location. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so u1 is going to be 
x1, 0, 0, x4, 0. So I only, I only keep the guys who actually hash there. And u2 is just going to be the 0 vector, because no one hashed there. u4 is going to have three, uh, 2 and 3 in it, et cetera. OK? And now, what's, what's say u1, u1 transpose? I'm going to have x1 squared. I'm going to have x4 squared. And then I'm going to have the diagonal terms corresponding to x1 and x4. So x1, x4 is going to be here. And uh, also x4, x1, x4 is here. And everything else is 0. Right? So basically, this is, this is keeping track of the guys who hash to the first, per, to the first uh, location. And I sum them up over all locations. I'm going to get exactly t sub r. The only issue is I'm also going to have these diagonal terms, which I don't want, because t sub r doesn't have them. So I subtract them off. Okay. And operator norm is a norm, so that's true. And what are the, uh, what's the largest eigenvalue of d? The largest eigenvalue of d is just the largest magnitude of x squared, okay, which is at most 1. What's the largest magnitude of this matrix? Uh, the largest, sorry, the, what's the largest eigenvalue of this matrix? Well, these uj's are the eigenvectors, and they span the image of the matrix. So the eigenvectors are, are these u sub j's. So the eigenvalues are this L2 norm squareds of them, which is at most 1. So the operator norm is at most like 2 over s. In fact, it's, it's actually at most 1 over s, but whatever. That doesn't matter so much. OK, so I have my Frobenius norm bound. I have an operator norm bound. And then I just, again, do Hansen right, and uh, it gives it. So I'll set L to be log 1 over delta. S should be at least L over epsilon to make this at most a half. K should again be 1 over epsilon squared times L to make this at most a half. And I have a half to the L of this delta. OK? So you might be saying, why is this off by root log 1 over epsilon? Right? Because it looks like S is just 1 over epsilon times log 1 over delta. The only caveat is uh, you need a code. So how do I get the code? So one way to get the code is uh, to pick a code at random. And if you pick a code at random and apply turn off and union bounds, it'll work. Uh, unfortunately, you'll need this kind of s. Uh, you, can, you can actually assume that d is not too large based on what I showed you earlier. right? And then when you plug that in for d, you get s needs to be something like this. So any questions about this construction? OK, so the construction where I'm, I'm not going to have to suffer this. So everything just uh, went to crap because of this last slide. So uh, let's avoid needing a good code. And let's just pick. So really, I have, I have code word i, and I have its jth position. So I have this, like, you know, my hash function, which tells me where do I map the ith coordinate in chunk j is specified by this code. But you know, rather than use a code word, why don't I just use a hash function? I'm going to pick a hash function at random okay, from some log 1 over delta y's independent family. Okay. And then I'm just going to bound the, moment, the, mo the elf moment directly. And that's going to amount to a bunch of combinatorics. OK. <coughs> so this is my error term. OK. Where now eta i j r is actually an indicator random variable, telling me that um, h of i j or h of i r is equal to h of i j. So now I'm going to have a hash function. I have these two hash functions h, which map d cross s. So the i the, this is for which column id it is and which chunk id it is into k over s. And then I have another hash function mapping d cross s into a random sign. OK. So, just, so, so if you step back, the construction is 
you have this matrix, and in column I, I have hash I, I to get where the sign, minus sign is. Yeah. Sign yeah. So it's, it's it, yep. So it's what I drew on the board before, except, yeah. except uh, rather than specify where these non zeros are by a code, yeah. you pick them at random. Using a hash function? Yes. It's hash of i. Hash of i j, or hash of i r. Yeah. OK. OK, so I'm going to break this up as being a sum of error terms uh, over chunks. Okay. And then notice now that the elf moment of this thing I can express as some summation over moments of the other thing. Okay. So at the end of the day, that should be directly analyzed. This construction. All this for yeah. yeah. And in fact, that's what I'm going to do. Okay. Any questions? So now I just need to bound these kinds of things. OK. So now I have slides, but I feel uh, this is probably best done on the board. So, so we're going to bound the expectation of this thing. OK. And the idea is OK, so I have this summation over stuff. And I want to bound, let's say, its teeth moment. OK? When I take this raised to the teeth power, I'm going to have a sum of a bunch of monomials. OK? And so one of those monomials, you know, like in the first product, in the first term of this product, it's going to take some xi xj. In the next term, it's going to take another xi prime xj prime. Then it's going to take an xi double prime xj double prime, et cetera. So I'm going to look at, I'm going to look at the monomials as being in correspondence with graphs, OK? With multigraphs. And let's say first, first I take x1 times x2. So this, is, so this is the vertex corresponding to x1. This is the vertex corresponding to x2. I put a label 1 on it because it's the first term that's in here. Okay? And then I take x3, x4. Let's say this is the vertex for x3. This is the vertex for x4. And I put a label 2 on it. And now x3, x8 comes. So that's this edge. And then x4, x8 is this edge. Or I guess this edge. So x4 is pointing into x8. And then uh, finally, I have x2, x10. I'm going to put this, I'm going to add a new vertex because x10 never appeared before. And it's the fifth term that I took, so I'll put a 5 on it. So is it clear what I'm saying the correspondence is to graphs? It's not clear why you want direction, but other than that. Oh, because this is a sum over i not equal to j. So I'm going to treat x1, x2 as being different from x2, x1. They both appear in this sum. Yeah, so this tells you, this direction tells you who was first, just so, just so that I can count things properly. OK. So good. That's one thing. So yeah, then it won't count. Twice. Yeah, then it won't count. Which corresponds to all vertices should have even degree. Right. Yeah. So now let me run the proof on the board. So you're looking at all these graphs with even, every node having even degree, and then you want the probability that all the hash functions, that none of the hash functions zero it out. Yeah, and I want to bound this, right. and I want to bound the summation over all graphs. Right. Yeah, so it ends up being just a lot of counting. So let's. There's like one trick at some point which I'll uh, show you. Okay, so. So this expectation of z sub r to the teeth power is well. It's a sum summation of monomials. Okay, what am I going to do? Notice that the only labels that I put on the graphs are the edge labels. Like this edge came from the first term, this edge came from the fifth term, et cetera. I'm not going to label the vertices. Okay? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to group monomials in this expansion which have isomorphic graphs. Okay? So let me sum over all graphs. 
G and some in the family of. So what are the graphs? They have T edges with distinct labels between one and T. It's directed. There could be multi edges, right? Um, there are no self loops though. Uh, everything should have even degree, as you said. Uh, and basically, the, and there are at least two vertices. That's the only constraint. Okay, so the sum over all graphs, the sum over all, let's say, i1 not equal to j1, it not equal to jt, such that this thing maps to g. f is my function that maps it to graphs. Okay? Uh, and then I have the expectation of the product of the eta, eta i, ijrs. Okay. Times the product of the uh, xi, xi, xj terms. Okay. So because uh, so let's say now that um, I'm going to write this on the left side because this is going to keep re reappearing. OK, so I'm going to say G has V vertices. It has T edges. It has M connected components. And then also, if the vertices are, let's say, uh, there are VI vertices in ith component and ti edges in that component, and di is the degree of the ith vertex. OK? Uh, OK, let's say uh, there are v vertices, though. DU is the degree of youth vertex. How about that? Is that? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so first thing, let me draw my graph. I want to compute this thing. Here's my graph. Of course, it's directed, but you know, there's something here. Uh, who knows what else is going on? Okay. Now, What is this saying? This is saying that um, all the ij things collide. That means that if you look at an edge, the endpoints of that edge better have collided. Okay? This guy collided with this guy, this guy collided with this guy, this guy collided with this guy. Okay? In other words, everyone in the same connected component should have mapped to the same place. Right? Across connected components, they can map to different places, that's fine. So how many settings of places are there for all the vertices total? All the vertices total, there are k over s to the v choices, right? How many ways are there to assign things to connected components? There's k over s to the m, right? In other words, the expectation of this thing is s over k to the v minus m. So I think I might need to do some changing of things. So s over k to the v minus m times a sum over all i1 not equal to j1, et cetera, product of x i u x j u. OK? And now <laughs> I want to bound this summation, OK? Right? So some of the i's and some of the j, like i, i1 might be the same as i5, or i2 might be the same as j7 or whatever. But let me, let me look at what are the, you know, the distinct indices that appear here correspond to the vertices, right? And every vertex is raised to some power, which is its degree, uh, right? OK, good. So, I ha so each term in this is going to look like you know, x u1 
uh, u1 uh, to some power d1 x u to uh, uv to some power dv, where all these powers are even. And the xi's are just random 1 minus 1. And the xi's, no, 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 that's the sigmas. Oh, sorry, what's the x? The x th my vector is x1 up to xd. Oh. That's my vector. Okay. Yeah. And the point is, so this term appears in the expansion of sum over i xi squared raised to the t, right? Or to the t over 2, I believe. No, to the t, to the t. OK? <clears throat> this I know is 1, right? And that means the summation over all choices for u and uv is at most 1. But I know more information. I know what the degree, I know what the exponents are. So what's the coefficient of the terms that have these exponents in this expansion? The coefficient there is 1 over some multinomial coefficient. Chi choose d1 over 2, dv over 2. What's the coefficient in this graph counting? Well, it's at most v factorial, because I can permute who goes to what vertex. So this thing is at most the sum over graphs s over k to the v minus m times v factorial over t choose d1 over 2, dv over 2. And you said I have really until 12.30, right? Okay, so, okay, so, uh, and then in the end, okay, so I'll just, I'll just like uh, say something and then, and then move on. So you do a bunch of counting, okay? Uh, you need to sum, you need to sum over, uh, it, it's a lot of computations, but uh, I mean, whatever, it's, uh, there's like one trick at some point, okay? I mean, <laughs> you can ask me if you really, if you really want to know the trick, but uh, okay. But you see what's going on. I mean, it's a lot of, just some counting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so Dasgupta Kumar and Sarlosh in their paper, they had a lower bound saying, um, if your matrix satisfies some properties, uh, I don't remember what those properties are right now, but um, then there's a lower bound of, um, I think the max of 1 over epsilon squared and um, 1 over epsilon times mm, the square root of log base 1 over epsilon of 1 over delta uh, when delta is, oh, let me say like this, log base 1 over epsilon of d when delta is O of D, 1 over D squared. That's the lower bound that they have. And I mean, I should, uh, I, I should caution you against these lower bounds, because Matushek showed a lower bound saying that uh, if your matrix has independent, uh, if, you're, if your matrix has independent entries, then you cannot do better than a constant level of sparsity, which is what uh, Akhliopdis got. But of course, you can get around that by not having independent entries in your matrix. So, uh, again, this new lower bound is a, like a, a lower bound against some specific type of matrices, which, um, you know, I'm not, I don't really know that there's not another type of matrix. So, okay, uh, so, yeah, let's just, this is a bunch of combination, uh, combinatorics, blah, blah, blah. Okay, good. Okay, and in fact, you can show that the analysis is tight. You can come up with vectors that basically force the moments to be, what you calculated. And uh, if you analyze what happens to those vectors, then um, basically they get messed up with pretty, pretty large probability. So, uh, so yeah, you, you cannot give a tighter analysis of the con this construction. Maybe you'd, you'd have to come up with a different construction. Yeah. Um, OK, and I, I really wanted to skip to open problems. So I'm going to also uh, talk about open problems, because I want to leave you with something. I don't know. Uh, OK, good. OK. So, the Johnson-Linenstrauss lemma actually states that the expectation of 
the indicator function of some quadratic form is large, right? Uh, <clears throat> right. So uh, this can be viewed as a degree two polynomial where the random variables are the entries of your matrix S. So uh, what we really want is a pseudorandom generator for some subclass of degree two polynomial threshold functions. Okay, and there's some there's some work on fooling degree two threshold functions, which unfortunately uh, really sucks when you try to apply it to the JL lemma because the seed length you need is polynomial and delta, whereas even KY's independence gives you something better than that. So uh, an open problem is develop optimal PRGs for them, and optimal PRGs for them also have applications to other to de-randomizing other things. So maybe a simpler open problem is to attack those, those simpler things first. Um, another thing is, uh, is to understand the best, uh, oh good, so I have it there. And in fact, I almost got it right. Okay, is understand uh, uh, the best sparsity that's achievable and there is this restricted lower bound. Um, and another question is, can you do embedding of sparse vectors in near linear time, maybe using something better than just uh, coming up with sparser matrices? OK. Um, another thing is speeding things up for dense vectors. So there are algorithms out there that get near linear time uh, for embedding uh, Johnson-Lin and Strauss, okay? Except uh, it's near linear time for dense vectors. So this d log d, d remembers the original dimension. This d log d would be there even if your vector only had like two non-zero entries or something. So is there a way to come up with, uh, first of all, is there a way to, to come up with something which is fast for dense vectors that gets the optimal target dimension? So right now, the fastest known thing that gets near, so the, there is a near linear time construction that was just recently presented at SOTA, but the target dimension is uh, slightly suboptimal, so that's open. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, actually, I, I have some ideas on potentially how you could do this, but uh, I can't prove it right now. Hmm. Okay, um, so conclusion, uh, so I showed you some stuff. And uh, here are some open problems, I guess, which I just finished mentioning. Um, there are actually some more open problems, but I, I'm out of time, so uh, I, can tell, I can tell you them later if you want to. See you around for the rest of the afternoon.